بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا رحم الرحم الحمد لله we have to fear to continue our study of Islamic plan for life and today we want to discuss religious minorities this is part of our social code of behavior when we were planning for this book we thought it's important to include what should we do with respect to non-muslim minorities when they live in muslim society muslim state and also what about muslim minorities who live in non-islamic society what should they do when they are there so sometimes you are making the majority but you must not neglect the rights of minorities sometimes you live as a minority and should establish respectful relation with the majority or other min minorities and at the same time be able to preserve your identity and preserve your own <coughs> virtues with being active and productive members of the large society so in this part we want to discuss both aspects first we start with non-muslims who live in the muslim world or muslim countries of course what we are saying now is about islamic teachings islamic teachings may be implemented in some muslim states maybe not or maybe some observe more maybe some less so no one can look at one muslim country or city or you know locality and generalize what is important is if you want to understand islam you need to refer to its sources to its literature to the opinions of great scholars and to the societies that were exemplar Muslim societies having said this but I am happy to say that in large not always but in large non-muslims have lived in the Muslim world for the most part with peace with friendship with uh, respectful relation there have been many Christians many Zoroastrians many Jews living in Muslim countries uh, in the Middle East in Africa in subcontinent otherwise other places who had very good relation uh, there is a very uh, good book for those who are interested about Muslim Christian relations called uh, Muslim Christian relations past present and future by a Jesuit uh, who comes from a mixed family his name is Owey and Mohammed he's a Catholic he's a Jesuit and I visited him actually a few years ago after reading the book at the University of Toronto he used to be there he might be retired now it's a very good book very informative and um, as much as I found it I found it uh, not biased and 
objective. He says uh, Christians who lived in Muslim countries they felt more comfortable than some Christians in Europe you know for centuries there were lots of tensions and wars between some different groups of Christians in Europe not because Christianity recommends war no unfortunately uh, power and human selfishness can misuse Islam Christianity Judaism or without using these names they can do this you can misuse the name of human rights I don't know freedom etc but the game is the same game is ego of some people so many uh, Christians in Europe f had difficulties like for example you know uh, Mennonites in Central Europe and some other Anabaptists they had to flee many of them went to Russia or to North America so this has been the situation but many Christians for hundreds of years even some of them equal to the history of the Islam they lived in the Muslim world and had no difficulty in Iran for example we have Armenians who have been there before Islam so for 14 centuries they have lived with Muslims and in Iran uh, Muslims and Armenians have very good relation so I'm saying that thanks to God despite some occasional problems for the most part there have been uh, peaceful examples of coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslim in the Muslim world although uh, still Islam is not perfectly practiced and implemented but because of the power of Islam and because of clarity that Islam has here for the most part it has been very good people like Isis they are not only anti non Muslims they are more anti some other Muslims as well they prefer to kill for example Shia more than killing a Jew or a Christian and this is clear for us very clear that it's not Islamic maybe a non Muslim who doesn't know these things or oh, this is Islamic no if, if it was Islamic why they are killing other Muslims why they are you know blowing uh, their mosques and why this is very a small fraction even not one in million if these people were uh, really representing Islam at least you must expect 50% uh, of Muslims you know to be like this or you know 30% at least 20% at least if 20% of Muslims today were like them is you would have hundreds of millions if Muslim population is about 1.5 for example so 20% would be 300 million so this shows that this has nothing to do with Islam so let's now go to Islamic understanding based on scholarship and see what Islam says about this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has a general framework for our behavior in a recent lecture that I had for the Mab'ath on the 27th of Rajab where I talked about universal message of Islam I try to clarify this you may refer to that lecture that the first principle in Islam is justice no one can compromise about justice even with respect to enemies even enemies of God you must observe justice Allah says 
لا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى Do not let hostility towards some people make you unjust Be just This is closer to piety So even enemies who fight the truth who kill believers who confiscate their properties you cannot do zulm to them or to their families or to their you know children or, or anything no zulm no injustice inna allah ya'muru bil adl allah commands you to observe justice but is justice enough no islam says justice is not enough it's just the basic level Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan You must observe justice and benevolence. You must be kind to others, do good to others. Ihsan for us is very important. It's not a marginal thing, it's not a mustahab thing. It's part of our iman, part of our religion. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنْ وَاتَّبَعَ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا Who is better in religion than someone who submits his face to God and is muhsin, does ihsan, is benefactor, is benevolent and follows the path of Abraham. So ihsan is very important. A Muslim has to be just and kind Ihsan Part of this Ihsan is in your words which is very important many things can be built or destroyed by using improper words This Ihsan comes into the way we talk to each other and the way we interact with each other in other forms but words are very important Quran says قولوا للناس حسنا when you speak to people speak what is good and beautiful husn has an element of beauty in addition to goodness khair means goodness or better depending on the context but husn has beauty as well qulu lan nas husna or yaqul allati hiya ahsan sometimes allah says you must say the most beautiful things the best things so part of ihsan is in words part of ihsan is in charity part of ihsan is in lending money in helping etc so justice and ihsan are two things which are universal part of ihsan is respecting trust which actually is something that even can be a requirement of justice that you have to keep your promises but you can also say it's a matter of ihsan as well justice and ihsan both that you respect even those promises which are not legally made just verbally you say something you must trustworthiness is something that has no exception in islam ada'ul amana ila al-barr wal fajr so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says to Muslims that your religion is a matter of faith in God but also bringing goodness to this world, a light to this world and in particular this can be done if you make sure that you observe justice and you observe ihsan being good being kind being helpful and there are other things which are coming and in surah mumtahana there is very clear guidance about whether 
we can extend these things to non-Muslims or not. Of course, as I said, with justice is very clearly mentioned, but if some people have some doubt, this ayah in Surah Mumtahana clarifies everything. Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi in Tafsir al uh, has beautiful discussion here and you can refer to Tafsir al about Surah Mumtahana verses 8 and 9 and also other books. I read for you the ayah, the, these two ayah and try to explain a little bit. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لا ينهاكم الله أن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين الله سبحانه وتعالى does not prohibit you with respect to the people who have not been fighting you and have not sent you into exile, to be kind to them, to be just to them. Indeed, inna Allah yuhibbul muqsateen. Allah loves those who are just. Inna ma yanhaakum Allah an alladheena qatalukum fi al-deen. وَأَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ وَظَاهَرُوا عَلَىٰ إِخْرَاجِكُمْ أَنْ تَوَلَّوْهُمْ It's very interesting. Allah only prohibits you with respect to the people who have been killing you for deen. Because you are believers in God, they kill you. They torture you. Or أَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ they ask you to leave your hometowns, your land, your houses, or help over this issue. Okay, Allah prohibits you with respect to such people only, but He prohibits you to do what? And to allow Him to have their vilaya to become part of their camp. Vilaya here is not friendship. Tavalli means to become part of the same camp of Vilaya. In lectures about social Vilaya, we have explained this. Also, there is a short clip about seven minutes on social Vilaya that encapsulate this. You can find it there. Well, I used to belong to the same camp, to have the same leadership, the same ideals. For example, after the ayah al-wilayah, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُغِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ After that, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So, tawalli means to choose someone as your wali, as being part of the same camp, working for their cause. Either they can be uh, in horizontal relation with you in, or in vertical relation with you. In any case, Allah says, those who have not ki been killing you and sent exile, you can be kind to them and do justice to them. Those who have been killing you and sent you to exile or helped over this, he only prohibits you with respect to these people and tawallawhum to become their awliya and choose them as your awliya. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ فَأُولَاكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ If you adopt them as your awliya, as your guardians or you know mutual wali, then you are unjust. So you see, there is no even mention here that with respect to these people you cannot observe justice or you know some kind of you know help it's just a matter of not be associated with them especially in their zulm working for the same cause with them as awliya 
choosing them as your leaders or as your you know uh, collaborators in their mischief so is there any problem if we help if we are kind to non-muslims no is there any problem if you are kind to even people who don't believe in God no actually you must be kind to everyone you must come be kind to even uh, plants animals you must bring rahmah of Allah to everything as much as possible when when it comes to justice actually we said it's without exception even with enemies even with the same people who have been killing you you cannot do zulm the maximum is that they receive justice if even someone like Yazid who has done so much of mischief can I do zulm by saying something wrong about him something he didn't say I say he did this to make him look worse than what he was? No. Can I do something wrong to his family? No. So we have to be very much careful. So Islam is very uh, uh, very much observant of not only rights of people but of having kindness as the main joint among human beings our humanity needs justice but it's ihsan that can keep us together family needs justice observing rights but ihsan can keep family together so in allah ya'mur bil adl wal ihsan Another thing which is very important is that Quran tells us that Allah has honored all children of Adam, all human beings. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَم Allah says, all children of Adam, we have honored them. وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرًا مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا All children of Adam are honored. Yes, some people have more honor. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Those who are more pious, more virtuous, those who are more exhibiting kindness, wisdom I don't know all the beautiful virtues that human beings can reflect of course they are receiving more honor but the basic line is to be a human being Amir al in his famous letter and instruction to Malik Ashtar said something which has become very well known in our history uh, he says to Malik Ashtar among different things he says وَأَشْعِرْ قَلْبَكَ الرَّحْمَةَ لِلْرَعِيَةِ أَشْعِرْ قَلْبَكَ الرَّحْمَةِ means make your heart have and sense rahma for whom? For Raya, for the people that you are going to be leading them, helping them, indeed Islamically serving them. Because according to Islam, those who have position are serving people, not that people should serve them. Walutf bihim. You should have kindness and favor for them wala takunanna alayhim sab'an wariyan taghtanimu aklahum very powerful imam says don't be like a wild animal its language is very strong to make it very clear any statement any politician 
who is violating rights of people and showing no respect to them is like an animal. Imam says to Malik Ashtar, don't be like a wild animal that enjoy eating them, like prey, like, you know, a wolf that now find, has found, for example, some sheep and wants to enjoy eating them. فَإِنَّهُمْ sinfan. People are one of the two groups. إِمَّا أَخٌ لَكَ فِي الدِّينِ أَوْ نَظِيرٌ لَكَ فِي الْخَارِ Either a brother for you in faith or similar to you in creation. This sentence, the last sentence, has become very importantly known even in Geneva, you know, you find it on the wall in the United Nations headquarters. And recently also the Pope, after the visit of Ayatollah Sistani, Hafadahullah, also mentioned this. I think this was mentioned in their discussion. So the honor that Allah has given all human beings is reflected in the way that Muslims should behave towards non-Muslims who live among them. The second thing is that according to Islam, according to Quran, la ikraha fiddin. There is no compulsion in religion, in the sense that no one should and indeed no one can impose faith. No one should because no one has right. No one can because faith, as Allah Metabatabai has said very beautifully in Al Mizan, faith is not something that you can force, you can impose. Faith is a matter of heart. If faith was just action, we could force people to do something, to bring this action. If faith was a matter of, for example, putting a uniform on, we could force people. But when faith is a matter of heart opening itself to a fact and submission to the truth, how can you impose it on someone who is not believing in this? Therefore, Muslims have understood. I'm saying for the most part, but thanks to God, the fact is so clear that for the most part, despite, you know, different groups of Muslims and different, you know, government and dynasties, they understood that people should be left with their own choice of religion. It's between them and their Lord. We should respect their choice, especially when it comes to people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, which after careful examination, it includes Muslims as well. Some people think Ahlul Kitab are only non-Muslims who believe in divine prophethood, revelation, books, Christians, Jews, for example, Zoroastrians, etc., Sabaites. Yes, in some texts, secondary text is like this. In some hadith, sometimes when they say kitabi, especially in fiqh, yes. But from Quranic perspective, Muslims are also Ahlul Kitab. Anyone who believes in Al Kitab is Kitabi, from Quranic perspective. We are all people of the book. It means we all believe in divine guidance in the book which is with God and it has been given in different representations through revelation to different messengers to convey to us. Otherwise, Al-Kitab is one. In some lectures about the concept of Al-Kitab, I have explained this, that according to Quran, Although we have different books, we have kutub in the Quran. Amana billah, amana rasul bima unzila ilayh, wal mu'minun kullun amana billah wa kutubihi wa rasulih, la nufarraqu bayna ahadan min rasulih. This is Quran. But the same Quran also says, Ja'atum rasuluhum bil bayyinati wa zubure wal kitab al-munir. 
not well kutubul munira so there is a way there is a sense in which we can talk about books kutub what we have in the history torah and jil quran suhuf this is possible to say books but what messengers brought what allah sent down is al kitabul munir illuminating book not al kutubul munir so one reality given throughout the history in different versions different editions like one encyclopedia but has different editions different versions the author is the same is god for humanity who are at the same in essence nature what is the core message laqad ba'athna fi kull ummatin rasulan an i'budu allah wa ajtanibu at-taqut the core message is this but there are some details some you know uh, rulings may change some you know maybe deeper you know different things but basically what is important is we are all people of the book we are all followers of abraham therefore when it comes to muslims christians jews zoroastrians sabaites who believe in this path of abraham then they should feel even more responsible towards each other's well-being and etc uh, there are some legal issues that you can find in detailed books about uh, rights of minorities for example the issue of non-muslims being exempted from certain taxes they don't you know pay certain taxes they don't pay you know homes zakat even they are exempted from you know uh, taking part in uh, defense muslim should provide them with security but instead of all those taxes and you know these type of things they give you know uh, some tax which is you know called jizya and this jizya replaces taxes that muslims give and also is for the services that they must receive and also uh, they can you know act according to their own laws they can have their own courts right now for example in iran we have you know constitution based on uh, shia understanding of fiqh and according to constitutions zoroastrian jews christians for their personal you know is it a divorce is it inheritance is marriage uh, all these issues that are for their personal affairs uh, they have their own courts they can go to the public court they can go to their own courts their own judges their own fiqh their own sharia to be uh, implemented by themselves Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very clear about Muslims observing rights of uh, non-Muslims who lived inside the Islamic state and he would he said for example we have here in the book that whoever disregards the rights of them people who had treaty with Muslims then he said they have done zulm to me if you do injustice to non muslims you have done injustice to me so he was basically claiming on their behalf and demanding on their behalf their rights amir al mumin alayhi salam in the same letter to malik ashtar he says if needed give your life in order to respect your promises so when you make a, for example contract for example with christians to live in their your under, uh, under your jurisdiction in your jurisdiction under your governance you must observe the promises that you have made even if it 
requires your life. Keeping one's promise is very important in Islam. Rafa is very important. Then we have something about uh, two beautiful examples from the life of Amir al muminin when he was actually Khalifa. So he had all the, you know, power and very vast area was under his governance. And these two examples, you know, show how much Islam wants us to live by moral standards, especially fairness and respect. For example, one day Amir al Mu'mineen, when he was Khalifa, was coming back towards Kufa. He was alone and he met a non Muslim. So they decided to travel because they had part of the journey uh, as a common you know, destination. So they were traveling together, talking to each other. Wh when they reached where Amir al Mumineen had to separate because Amir al was going to Kufa, the capital, and that non Muslim was going somewhere else. Amir al Mumineen went and uh, continued journey with non-Muslim, the non-Muslim. He said, I thought you were going to Kufa. I said, yes, something like this. You know. uh, he said, uh, why are you coming then with me? And Amir al Mumin said, because our prophet has taught us that when we travel with someone, that person has some rights over us. One right is that now I should escort you and he was so happy this non-muslim I said so this shows that your prophet was so much emphasizing and morals that he has managed to you know make such followers and then uh, he became so happy that Imam Ali did this and b when he knew that he was actually Khalifa <laughs> traveling alone so simply and even observing these details he was so happy and after some time he became Muslim and became actually one of the good companions of Imam Mahdi Sharif. if you want the story it's in the second volume of Al-Kafi there is a chapter Husnu Sahaba about being good companion and the right of companions when they travel together in journey what's the right that they have over each other another story is when Amir al muminin was Khalifa again so uh, one day he lost his shield or armor something like that and it was found with a Christian person so Amir al muminin took this person to the court, although he was Khalifa, <laughs> but he took him to the court. So everyone should, you know, take their co cases to the court, not decide by themselves. And said to the judge that this is my armor and this man has got it. I have not sold it. I have not gifted it and it is with him then the judge said to that person that what do you say he didn't say because Khalifa says this you know give it back to him no he asked the other person to present his case he said this is my own but I am not rejecting what the Khalifa is saying but this is my own the judge looked at Imam Ali and said, you are muddai, you are claiming. The other person is munkar, is denying. In fact, we say, al bayyanatu ala al muddai wal yamino ala man ankar. 
So the judge said to Amir al Mumin salam, "You are mudai because this person has aliyad. You know, qaidat aliyad. Remember, in Hujjat Academy, we had jurisprudential rules. This person has this in his control. You are mudai. You claim that it's yours. You have to bring bayil. <laughs> Who are your witnesses?" Amir al Mumin said, "I don't have witnesses." So he said. Then I cannot, uh, you know, help you, and this remains with that person. So, Amir al Mumin salam smiled and said, "Yes, you are right. I need to have witness, and I don't have witness." This Christian person knew that this belongs to Amir al Mumin salam. When he saw this level of you know, akhlaq and justice and, you know, standards. He woke up that why, you know, I'm doing this, you know. And he uh, decided to give back. And then he said, this type of governance is the governance of prophets. So you must be following true prophetic tradition. And after some time, he became a Muslim, and he was actually one of the people who was in the camp of Imam Ali in the Battle of Nahrawan against Khawarij. Then we have a discussion about Muslim minorities in non-Muslim societies. Wherever Muslims live, they should exhibit Islamic values. They should exhibit this justice that we talked about it. Ihsan that we talked about it. Thanks to God, for the most part, Muslims who have lived outside Muslim countries have been hard-working citizens low-biding citizens, very productive, and their commitment to family values, to, I don't know, uh, many virtues like hospitality, etc., have been appreciated by other people. You have some of the most educated people, some of the most charitable people among Muslims. I'm not saying only Muslims, but you find Muslims have very good record and uh, statistics show this. If there are Muslims who don't practice Islam completely, they either they don't practice at all or they practice just some issues, that has nothing to do with Islam. But true Muslims, wherever they are, they are very careful about justice, about ihsan, about respectful behavior, about being productive, not being burden on others, rather being helpful. And this is what has been happening and of course we as Muslims should try to always improve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat linnas. You are the best people who are brought forth for mankind, not above mankind. Linnas to benefit people. We should benefit people. We should be manifestations of Rahman and Rahim. Rahman has mercy for all, Rahim has additional for believers. So we should be Rahman with everyone and Rahim with believers. Not one of the two, both Rahman and Rahim. Unfortunately, sometimes in some societies, Either they are against all faith communities or against some of them. Here Muslims are in more difficult situation because not only they need to observe their personal duties, social community duties, but they have also to ask for their rights, especially rights of freedom of religion, freedom of you know their religious practice. But with of course, manners that Islam teaches them with hikmah, with wisdom, with 
nice communication. We should use legal platforms to demand our rights or rights of other people. A Muslim is not just uh, speaking for his own rights, rights of everyone. But for sure, we have to also defend our own rights. If they don't allow, for example, practice of hijab, if they don't, I don't know, uh, let, for example, Muslim schools, things like this, then with wisdom, with uh, trying all the legal avenues, legal means, with consultation, with networking, with building bridges with other communities, with using media, with you know, uh, advocacy, with lobbying, all these things we have to use so that we can make sure that uh, justice is observed. And something very important is that Muslims, for their own sake, and also for the benefit of the hosting society, they should try to keep their identity. Because their identity, if it is preserved, it can be added value. My faith, my akhlaq, my virtues, my family life, my community life, help the society. In some societies that are uh, really democratic, they very much appreciate faith communities because they bring lots of other, you know, values. It's not just you know they pay tax. No, when people belong to community, when people have uh, clear uh, orientation towards family, towards community, everyone benefits especially when secular society is somehow freeing themselves from responsibility towards many of you know moral values or you know spiritual things and religious things so faith communities contribute a lot so for the benefit of hosting community as responsibility that we have to be witness as quran says that kadhalika ja'alnakum ummatan wasata the takunu shuhada ala nas. We have to be witnesses for people, and also for our own uh, families, children. We need to be careful about keeping our identity clear, but a type of identity which is not based on exclusion or fear. It's based on confidence, on honoring yourself and others and as I have explained in some lectures about identity for example University of Palermo a type of understanding of identity that helps you understand how to relate to others without losing your own uh, integrity okay we stop here inshallah bi'iznillah we continue uh, Islamic plan for life next week which will be at the last session in this 12th term of Hujjat Academy. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen.